Welcome to class three for diabetes. Today's focus is going to be all about heart healthy eating. The good news is that you don't have to follow separate guidelines to manage both your diabetes and your heart health. The nutrition guidelines complement each other very well. If you'd like to follow along, the heart healthy eating section in your On the Road to Diabetes Health booklet starts on page 23. The outline for today's class includes following a healthy eating pattern and the benefits of doing so, how to include more plant-based proteins into your days, we'll go more in depth on fiber, fats, and sodium, and how to read for these nutrients on the nutrition facts labels, and we'll discuss any tips that you can add when you're eating out, especially if you're on the go and you need to buy something very quickly, there are healthy options that you can choose to stick to your healthy eating goals. Healthy eating can improve so many aspects of your health. So the foods that you choose to consume daily are going to, in the long run, have a large effect on your health outcomes. Specifically, when it comes to heart health, we're talking about our blood fats, our cholesterol levels, and our triglycerides, inflammation in the body, blood flow, so how thick or thin your blood is, as well as blood pressure. So if we think of these four points here, and then we compare that to different foods that we can eat. Out of these four health points, what do you think that eating vegetables and fruit regularly will help to improve? Your blood fats, inflammation, blood flow, or blood pressure? If you guessed all of them, you're correct. For beans, lentils, and whole grains, again, take a wild guess. What will it improve? Again, it's everything. Fish will also improve things across all categories, nuts and seeds, and healthy oils. So just to highlight here that a variety of all of these foods in your diet are going to have an overall healthy impact on your heart health in many different ways. So you don't have to do everything at once or change your diet all at once. Even if you just focus on one thing, maybe it's eating more fish, it's still going to have a positive outcome across many different heart healthy outcomes and then after you've mastered that or you've been working on that for a while try and think of something else that you can try maybe it will be switching to a higher fiber grain or other examples that we'll talk about in class today if something does stick out at you please write it down and this could be one of your goals at the end of class today going forward making a nice list of things that you can work on in the future that you yourself are interested in actually doing and think that you'll be successful with. Before we talk about cholesterol and why there is a concern with cholesterol in the blood, let's talk about damage to the arteries. Arteries are blood vessels or tubes that carry oxygen throughout the body in the blood, from the heart to the rest of the body. Artery walls can become damaged over time. Damage to these artery walls allows substances in the blood, such as cholesterol and calcium, to lodge into the artery and get stuck. This can result in plaque. Over time, as this plaque builds up, it can rupture, causing blood clots. And when this clot causes a blockage, perhaps in the heart, it results in a heart attack. If that blockage occurs in the brain, it results in a stroke. Here on this image, you can see two different types of arteries. The top one is a nice healthy artery without much damage to it and the blood is flowing nice and freely throughout it. The bottom artery has had damage and plaque buildup and here you can see the blood is having a hard time passing through. Over time this plaque can completely block and cause cardiovascular disease. Now as much as possible you want to prevent this plaque from building up and a big contributor to this plaque buildup is going to be inflammation and damage. So if we think of things that can damage the arteries, we can consider high blood pressure. Think of high blood pressure, lots of pressure from the blood going through your arteries, um, like your house pipes. So if the pipes in your house get blocked, they can burst and it causes damage in your house. Well, the same thing in your body. If your arteries get too much pressure and they burst, well, that's not going to be a good result for your health. Other things can, can cause damage are high blood sugar, more sugar bumping into these artery walls, high blood cholesterol and triglycerides, smoking, too much abdominal fat, saturated and trans fats in excessive amounts especially, 
Stress can also cause increased inflammation, and along with stress, this can result from lack of sleep as well. And then all of these, in turn, can result in inflammation and damage. Good nutrition plays a role in preventing artery wall damage and reducing risk factors mentioned on the previous slide. Remembering to eat regular meals and a balanced plate can help you plan your meals to lower your risk of heart disease and maintain healthy blood cholesterol levels, as well as balancing your blood sugar. This slide might be familiar to you from class two, and it's Canada's healthy food guide. So we want to try and remember these guidelines going through our presentation today as well. Heart healthy eating starts with eating more vegetables and fruits. Remember to keep the fruits to no more than two to three servings a day. However, vegetables we want to get at least our half a plate two times a day. We want to get at least seven servings or more. So if you are following that recommendation of half your plate of vegetables twice a day, plus including some fruits at a snack or two, or maybe some vegetables at your snacks, you will easily be meeting that as one serving of vegetables is only half a cup of cooked vegetables or one cup of leafy greens or one whole fruit or half a cup of let's say cut up fruit. So the serving sizes are small but again just keep in mind that healthy balanced plate method. What do you notice when you look at the slide here? What are in all the different pictures? Hopefully you'll say a lot of different colors. So that's to signify getting a variety of different fruits and vegetables every week is going to be very important to make sure your body gets all the vitamins and minerals that it needs. Also, all the bright and deep colors, so the blues, the purples, the reds, are going to be a great source of antioxidants. Specifically, blueberries are known to be very high in antioxidants, and antioxidants help to reduce inflammation in your body, which we just learned is a key contributor to damage in the arteries. If you're trying to think of ways that you can include all these different foods, there really is so many different ways to prepare them. You can eat them cooked or raw. You can roast your vegetables for a completely different flavor. You can even buy frozen vegetables, which are actually going to be picked at peak ripeness and frozen right away. So they're gonna be a really high nutrient profile and they're usually cheaper as well. The other thing to keep in mind if you're trying to keep in mind cost is to buy fruits and vegetables that are in season. You can include fruit as a snack. You can also use fruit in your baking. You can even use vegetables in baking. For example, a zucchini bread. Try and add vegetables to soups, stews, chilies, stir fries, different sauces, and curries. So many fun ways to include them. And you can always have salad in the fridge for a quick and easy way to have your vegetables with a meal. So I always encourage buying some sort of leafy green every week. When trying to fill that quarter of your plate with grains, try to choose whole grains. The reason why that is, is because the whole grain still contains all of the grain, including the bran and the germ, where white grains or refined grains do not. Having more whole grains will help reduce your risk of heart disease. Let's go over some options. For breakfast, perhaps you can choose oatmeal. Going for large flake or steel cut oats are gonna be much better than instant oats as they're less processed. And try and flavor your oatmeal without sugar, perhaps use some cinnamon or berries. In the bread department, sprouted or whole grain bread are typically gonna be the highest fiber breads. And make sure you're not misled by the word multigrain, which might still be low in fiber you'll want to check the package and the nutrition facts table still. If an ingredients list includes wheat flour in it, wheat flour is just another way to say white flour, so don't be misled. When it comes to pasta, there's so many different options. You can get whole wheat pasta, black bean pasta, edamame pasta, the list goes on. There's even a white pasta called Catelli Smart Pasta, which uses white flour and a white fiber, so no one will even, even be able to see that it has fiber in there. Perhaps if you have little kids that don't like whole wheat or the look of brown grains. Other options include quinoa and barley, which are also very high protein grains. So specifically, if you are vegetarian and you're having a difficult time eating enough protein with your meal, these would be excellent grains to include. You can use them instead of rice 
uh, as a side or you can throw them into salads. Here you'll see a salad that has a lot of different vegetables, beans for protein, and it has some quinoa in there to include some healthy carbohydrates. Don't feel that everything needs to stay in its separate sections on the balanced plate. Feel free to mix all the foods together once you know their portions. Keeping in mind if you do add quinoa to the salad, it should not be more than a one cup portion. Another grain choice that tends to be forgotten sometimes is couscous. This one is also very easy to prepare and another healthy whole grain choice. So if you had some new ideas here, hopefully you can add some different grains to your day-to-day -day basis for some variety as well. Try to eat plant-based proteins daily. If you're not there yet, that's okay. Increasing your consumption slowly is fine as well. Maybe you start with one to two servings of beans or lentils per week and we're towards increasing that to daily and trying a variety of different plant-based proteins listed here. The reason why these proteins are so good for your heart health is because they're very high in fiber and are going to help lower your cholesterol levels naturally. They'll also replace some of the saturated fat in your diet if you're replacing animal proteins with plant proteins. So how can we include these foods? Here are some ideas. You can add chickpeas, black beans, or any type of bean to a salad, stews, or use as a spread, such as hummus, like you'll see in the top photo. These can also be used as a dip or on top of crackers at a snack. You can try low sodium canned beans or lentils and keep them on hand for easy cooking and adding into recipes. Just make sure you rinse them well beforehand. Nuts and seeds can also be used as a snack or sprinkled on top of cereals, salads, or even your peanut butter toast. You can reduce your ground meat consumption by adding lentils or beans to reduce the meat portion. For example, when you're making meatballs, patties, sauces, why not just mix some lentils into them? You probably won't even notice they're there. You can use split red lentils to thicken in sauces or soups. Try adding tofu to a stir fry instead of meat or chicken. You can also make a vegetarian chili. Hopefully this has inspired you to try a few different ways to add plant proteins to your day. The past few slides have been talking about foods which contain fiber. We want to include fiber regularly in our diet, not only for good blood sugar control, but also to help lower your LDL cholesterol naturally. So if that's been an issue for you, getting more fiber in your diet will be a very big help. Fiber not only improves our heart health and our cholesterol levels, but also helps to keep us full longer, can help with weight management, and also helps to keep our bowels regular. That being said, if you are increasing your fiber intake, especially if you're increasing it quickly, you might run into some issues with constipation. So to avoid that, make sure you are drinking enough fluid throughout the day. You may need to increase what you're currently consuming in terms of water, especially to prevent constipation. Our goal is to increase our fiber intake from what we're currently consuming. So if you're already consuming some whole grains and other high fiber foods, trying to increase it further or aiming for at least 30 grams of fiber per day is the goal for most adults. You can find fiber in the following foods, whole grains, nuts and seeds, fruits and vegetables, and beans and legumes. You can make sure you're getting enough by consuming these regularly at all your snacks and your meals. We don't expect you to count up all your fiber for the day, but if you're making an effort to make these whole food high fiber choices every time you eat, you'll definitely be meeting that goal. Another thing you can do is look at labels. For example, if you look at a bread label, four grams of fiber per slice would be considered a high amount of fiber. For other foods, such as cereal, having four or more grams of fiber per serving will be considered a high fiber cereal. If you're buying granola bars, look for four grams of fiber or more in a granola bar. Generally, any food that has four grams of fiber or more per serving will be considered a high fiber choice. So those are some good things to look out for. Next, we'll move on to the topic of fats. You want to make sure you're eating healthy fats daily. That's right, every single day. Why do we need fats? They reduce our risk for heart disease, help us to stay full longer, slow down our digestion, which can in turn improve blood sugar control, and they're also an important building block of our body's hormones. 
for example, our sex hormones or also our thyroid hormones. Healthy fats are found in whole foods and liquid oils. These fats are called unsaturated fats. They help to lower your LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol, and triglycerides. Unsaturated oils are liquid at room temperature. You want to try and include 2-3 to three tablespoons of fats each day, most of them coming from the healthy fat sources, again liquid at room temperature oils. A serving could also be a quarter of a cup of nuts or seeds, and half an avocado would also be considered one healthy fat serving. If you're wondering what oil to use for cooking, it is acceptable to use olive oil for most of your cooking needs, as most cooking methods do not raise the temperature above the smoke point. If you're cooking at high heat, try and use avocado or grapeseed oil, which have a much higher smoke point and won't be creating trans fats when you heat the oil. Because when you overheat an oil and it starts smoking, you're actually creating trans fats in that oil, which is not good for your heart health. It's important to include healthy fats for weight loss as well, since it can improve your fullness and help to reduce cravings. Just be sure not to overdo it since fats are high in calories, so there's a fine balance be between getting enough and overdoing it. Now let's talk about one particular type of healthy fat called an omega-3 fatty acid, which is a type of unsaturated fat and it has a multitude of heart healthy benefits, including lowering your blood pressure, lowering triglycerides, improving blood flow, so making your blood less sticky. It's essentially a natural blood thinner and decreasing inflammation. Again, keeping those arteries super healthy and preventing plaque buildup. We want to try and consume omega-3s from fish if possible. That's going to have the best heart healthy benefit compared to other sources. So trying to eat fish at least twice a week or more is going to make sure you're getting enough omega-3s. And the more fat in the fish, the more omega-3 it's going to have. So essentially salmon, trout, mackerel, herring, sardines, tuna, oysters, and mussels are all going to be really good sources. Other fish are still healthy to consume. They're just not going to be as high in omega-3s. And if you're wondering what one serving is, it would be roughly 2.5 ounces so close to about the size of a deck of cards. And you can also measure it using half a cup. Say if you're eating canned fish, half a cup would be one serving. Do note that albacore tuna is high in mercury unless it's a product of Canada, which is going to be clear on the label. You just have to read it and make sure it's a product of Canada. Otherwise, the other albacore tuna products are going to be high in mercury, so instead you'd want to buy canned light tuna or canned salmon. Other sources of omega-3s that you can include regularly in your diet include chia seeds and hemp seeds. These are both going to be great sources of fiber, and hemp seeds is also a very high source in protein. Another option would be flax seeds. If you are choosing flax seeds, make sure you grind them before you eat them because if the seed is whole, you're not going to absorb all the benefits. The other option would be omega-3 eggs. These eggs are made by feeding the chicken ground flax meal. Walnuts are also a very high source of omega-3 for a nut. And you can use flaxseed oil, but do make sure that you don't heat it. You should only be using it kind of cold or at room temperature, for example, in a salad. And canola oil and soybean oil are other sources. If you can, try adding up to two to three tablespoons of omega-3 rich seeds that we mentioned here every day. And again, you can sprinkle those into your cereal. You can use them in baking, in yogurt, on oatmeal. So try and use those every day if you can. We were talking about healthy fats before and mentioned that they were called unsaturated fats. However, now we're going to talk about saturated fats, which typically have a negative outcome for your heart health. They increase your total and LDL cholesterol, and a high LDL cholesterol level can lead to a buildup of plaque inside the artery wall. You can easily distinguish these because saturated fats are going to be solid at room temperature, and unsaturated fats were liquid at room temperature. Most saturated fat is found in animal foods, as well as tropical oils such as coconut oil and palm oil. 
If you look at the photos on here, you'll see butter, sausages, fatty cuts of beef, and also fatty deli meats, as well as bacon. To lower your LDL cholesterol and reduce your saturated fat intake, you can replace it with other saturated fats in the following ways. Using olive oil instead of butter on vegetables, pasta, and on salads. Using avocado on sandwiches and in salads, or as a dip with vegetables. You can even mash avocado with canned tuna or salmon instead of mayonnaise. Try and choose leaner cuts of meat products and take off any extra fat that you see, remove the skin, or eat a smaller portion, and even replace some of them with plant-based proteins such as lentils and tofu. Try and avoid processed meats. Also try and use coconut oil in moderation as it is high in saturated fat as well, so not recommended for everyday cooking. If you're choosing salad dressings, try and avoid the creamy ones and choose mostly the ones with an olive oil base. Small amounts of butter and coconut oil are okay sometimes. Try and choose non-hydrogenated soft tub margarines instead of hydrogenated margarines. The other type of fat I want to mention quickly are trans fats. These are very damaging to the artery lining as they increase LDL more than saturated fats and also decrease your HDL. Trans fats come in two different forms. They're man-made forms and also naturally occurring forms. Man-made trans fats are made by the process of hydrogenation. These are no longer allowed in Canadian food manufacturing since September 2018. This was a major source of trans fats for Canadians previously. However, trans fats do naturally occur in beef and dairy products as cows naturally produce some trans fats. But the amount in these sources are relatively small compared to the man-made sources. If you're choosing hard margarines and shortenings, they have been replaced from using hydrogenated oils to using palm oils. But remember, palm oil is still a saturated fat, so hard margarines and shortenings are still going to be a high source of saturated fat. So try and choose more unsaturated fats when you can. One way to reduce your saturated fat intake would be to choose lean meats. We still want to make sure we're eating protein at every single meal. If you are eating animal proteins, you'll want to choose leaner options, such as chicken or turkey. Do make sure you trim off any visible fat that you see and take the skin off. You can cook the food with the skin on, but just remove it before you eat it. When it comes to beef, if you're choosing lean cuts of beef, that would be best, ones with less white visible in the meat there. And if you're choosing ground beef, just go for extra lean. If you're cooking your meat proteins, there are going to be better ways to do so to reduce the fat content. This includes steaming, poaching, stewing, and boiling as good kind of water-based cooking methods. And another good thing to do with meat is to marinate it in acidic solutions such as lemon juice or vinegar before you cook it. This will reduce the amount of inflammatory compounds that are produced as a form of cooking the meat. And uh, cooking it at lower heating temperatures will be better as well opposed to high heat. Eggs are another great source of protein that are lean. And the amount of eggs to consume a week really varies from person to person. I would typically recommend no more than one to two eggs per day. There is a disagreement on whether cholesterol in food really affects our blood cholesterol levels, as there are a lot of conflicting studies, so it's really hard to say. Um, but just know that overall, the amount of cholesterol you eat in your diet will not affect your body's cholesterol levels as much as your whole diet in total if we're looking at it. So in other words, if you're following that balanced plate method, getting at least half a plate of vegetables, you're getting your high fiber whole grains, including some plant-based proteins, doing those things is gonna have a much better impact on your heart health and cholesterol levels than just focusing on how many eggs you're eating in a week. So again, typically one to two eggs per day, including the yolk is fine. And the amount depends on many factors, such as your actual blood cholesterol level, your genetics, the overall quality of your diet, like I just mentioned, and your impact on satiety. So for some people, they really need that extra protein to feel full. So I hope that answers any egg questions that you might have had. When choosing dairy and alternatives, you want to try and look for lower fat options. 
Lower fat milk can be classified as 2% fat milk or lower. One serving of milk or milk alternatives can include one cup of milk or one cup of soy milk or almond milk, making sure that you're looking for unsweetened products that are fortified with calcium and vitamin D. Just another reminder that a vitamin D supplement is recommended for all Canadians over the age of 50. Milk is also a source of protein. Most milk alternatives are not a source of protein, with the exception of soy milk and pea protein milk. A brand example of pea protein milk would be Ripple. Watch portions of cheese. One serving would be 1.5 ounces or 50 grams, roughly the size of two fingers. Lower fat cheeses would classify as 20% milk fat cheese or less. Some options include a mild cheddar or mozzarella. Do try and get your cheese in a block and not get the single slices, which are typically higher in sodium. Cottage cheese and plain Greek yogurt are also very good sources of protein. One serving of cottage cheese would be half a cup, and a serving of Greek yogurt or yogurt would be three quarters of a cup. Try and save ice cream for a treat when you're out instead of keeping it in the house for daily eating. It is recommended if you're getting any of these products that you get them unsweetened. You can flavor your yogurt with fresh fruit or berries, one teaspoon of jam, some vanilla, cinnamon, perhaps some lemon juice and lemon rind. Trying to look for those non-sugar sweeteners. Natural would be best. Cottage cheese does have a high amount of sodium, so be mindful of the sodium already in the meal from other sources. You can try and find lower sodium options of cottage cheese. Dry curd cottage cheese, a very low in sodium but also low in calcium, can be added to oatmeal, smoothies, lasagna, and other pasta dishes to add protein. Greek yogurt has higher protein content than regular yogurt and is a very good option especially for blood sugar management. In this case, I would suggest going for a 0% fat Greek yogurt because in that case there's not going to be any extra sugar added to make the yogurt taste good because of its high protein content and rich mouthfeel. Paneer can be a protein choice in curries and stews instead of meat as well. So whether or not you are eating dairy from cows or alternatives, do make sure they're fortified with the vitamins mentioned. And if they're not high in protein, you're gonna to wanna to include other protein options at the meal. When it comes to sodium, we're trying to limit our intake to no more than 2300 milligrams of sodium per day or less. If you have high blood pressure, it would be recommended to do slightly less and no more than 2,000 milligrams. 2,300 milligrams of sodium, as you can see from the first line of the table, is equivalent to one teaspoon of salt. Sodium is the chemical name for salt. It is a natural mineral found in most foods in small amounts. If we reduce our sodium, this can help to lower our blood pressure and is very good for your heart and kidneys. Most people eat upwards of 3,000 milligrams of sodium per day or more. So it's important to gradually decrease your sodium intake so you get used to tasting less salt in your food. Note that this can take a few weeks to get used to and try to decrease your salt intake gradually. If you look at the slide here, what do you notice as you go down the list? How does the quality of the foods change? At the very top, we have more processed foods. And at the very bottom, we have less processed foods. And you'll see in comparison that the sodium content decreases as you go down the list as well. Meaning that the more processed the food is, typically the higher its sodium content. If we look at the second line on the table, the three ounces of sausage or ham, and compare that to the bottom of the table where it says three ounces of pork, the sodium content decreases from 1,000 milligrams of sodium for the sausage or ham to only 75 milligrams of sodium for the pork. Eating more fresh whole foods that have been unprocessed is going to drastically reduce the amount of sodium you're getting in your diet. The other example here is cheese. 20 grams of processed cheese has 300 milligrams of sodium, whereas a hard block of cheese 30 grams of that has 150 milligrams of sodium. Other things to note are the soups and the frozen dinners coming in at about 700 milligrams of sodium each, just for one cup. 
If we think back to our sodium limit, if we're aiming for 2,000 milligrams of sodium per day, if we space that over a few meals, we're trying to go no more than roughly four, four to 500 milligrams of sodium per meal. So these foods can make it very difficult to stick to that because the serving sizes here are still very small but high in sodium. Other things to keep in mind are the condiments. As you can see, so soy sauce can add up fairly quickly. Other things like packaged cereals, the bran flakes, one cup is 300 milligrams again, whereas oatmeal, one cup is only five to 10 milligrams. So the bran flakes are gonna be fine every once in a while, but do try and alternate your meals every day and try and get some unprocessed choices in there on a regular basis. If we look at one slice of bread in the middle of the table, that's another factor to keep in mind. The range of sodium can vary quite a bit, anywhere from 80 to over 200 milligrams of sodium per slice. So hopefully this gives you an idea that the more you change to whole foods, foods that are not processed, you're going to be reducing your sodium content very much. Give your taste buds at least a month to adapt and see the changes you've made. The other thing you can try is taking the salt shaker off the table and trying to enjoy the natural flavor of the food. If you're not there yet, perhaps just use less when you're adding it. And try not to use it when you're cooking. Let's see if you can make some lower sodium choices for the following options. If you're buying store-bought canned soup, what could be a lower sodium alternative? Pickles? What about for potato chips if you're looking for a salty or crunchy snack? What else could you put in a sandwich instead of deli meat, which is also going to be really high in sodium? And lastly, what would be another alternative to salted nuts? If you had a chance to think about it, let's see how you did. The following options could include, for instead of regular soup, you could do a low sodium soup store bought or a low sodium broth if you're making your own soup. So yes, you have the option to either make your soup using way less salt that you would find in a store-bought soup, or specifically looking for soup options that say low sodium on the label. And this is very important. We want it to specifically say low sodium because if it says lower sodium, it could still be a high sodium product. And then instead of pickles, really any type of fresh vegetable will be a better lower sodium alternative. So you can even do regular red peppers, carrots, whatever you like. Pickles really are cucumbers that have been pickled. So instead of potato chips, you could do regular natural popcorn. Even if you wanted to salt it yourself afterwards, that would still be less than buying potato chips or buying pre-salted and pre-buttered popcorn. And popcorn is also going to be a wonderful heart healthy option. It's very high in fiber as well. And then instead of deli meat in your sandwiches, it would be best to use leftover meat that you had perhaps at dinner the night before, or maybe you cook a few chicken breasts early in the week and keep them in the fridge to pull out and use in sandwiches. Another option would be using a rotisserie chicken that you can just buy from the store. And then lastly, you can get any type of nut unsalted that would be best. So here are some ideas that maybe you could use if you haven't thought of already. Remember to read the labels because most sodium we eat does not come at the table or is added in cooking. Most of it's going to be coming from prepackaged foods. So if you're making the lower sodium choices in the grocery store, that's a great uh, start and it's going to be lowering your sodium intake a lot. Some other tips to lower your sodium are going to be eating out less often, cooking at home, reducing the use of packaged and canned foods, reducing the salt in your cooking and at the table, but this is gonna be a minor reduction. Switch to low sodium snack choices like we mentioned here, and use other seasonings such as herbs, spices, lemon, garlic, and vinegars to add flavor when you're cooking. Let's see how we can make some meals more healthier if we are eating out. Still trying to reduce the amount of times we eat out in a week, but if you are going to eat out, let's see how you can brainstorm some different ideas. Here we have four different photos, the top one with a burger and fries. Some healthier swap outs could be a side salad instead of the french fries, or perhaps you ask for the sauce on the side. It looks like there is some extra bacon and sauce 
on top of the burger, so there's going to be a lot of fat in this meal. You could also ask for a whole wheat bun to increase the fiber. And if we are really trying to go lean here, you could always ask for a grilled chicken burger instead of a hamburger or making sure we're not getting the breaded burgers too often or the breaded chicken. On the right side, we have a photo with french fries and chicken strips and some coleslaw and some plum sauce. Altogether, this is going to be a very high fat along with a very high carbohydrate meal, which is especially not good for either diabetes or heart health. So we really want to limit how often we're doing this. It should be very seldom. And there are no different colors on our plate, so we're missing our vegetable section. And ideally, we don't want our protein to be breaded because, again, there's already carbs on the side. There's already a large amount of french fries. So making sure the protein is perhaps grilled or steamed or just not breaded. And then ask for a different sauce. So anything like a plum sauce, some barbecue sauces often have a lot of sugar in them. Going for more of like a ranch perhaps or a vinaigrette dressing. If you're getting a salad, that would be a different meal. But the plum sauce is going to be a blood sugar culprit. And then we have the pickle as well. So instead of the coleslaw, it would have been better to have like a fresh garden or house salad. Coleslaw also typically does have added sugar to it when you're buying it from restaurants or from the store. So just be mindful of that. So perhaps if you are getting this meal, you would split it with someone and get a side salad, trying to get some vegetables in at some point there. On the bottom left, we have different soy sauces. If you go to Japanese restaurants, you can always ask for the low sodium soy sauce. It's going to be the one with the green lid, often the red ones on the table, and that one is the regular high sodium option. On the bottom right, we have a breakfast. Now, what is missing from this plate? We are missing both our grain section and we're missing our vegetable section. So basically this entire plate is just filled with protein and they're also going to be high fat and high sodium proteins, specifically the bacon and the sausage. Um, probably the healthiest part of this plate is going to be the eggs. And we also want to avoid refried beans. Fresh beans would be better. So perhaps with this meal we could have had a slice or two of whole grain toast with the eggs and maybe if we really did want the bacon we would do one or two slices here really not combining the sausages and the bacon kind of pick one that you would prefer on this day and then you could also add in a healthy fat such as half an avocado or something like that to bring in some color to the meal perhaps some sliced tomatoes as well so if you are going to restaurants another tip would be to look up the menu before you go here in BC we have at least 61 restaurants that have all their nutrition facts labels and tables online so essentially you would just google the restaurant you're going to so here for example we could choose pita pit and you would go pita pit nutrition facts in the search engine and the pdf or web link for that should be one of the first ones to pop up and there you would find all the information the nutrition facts table with all the sodium the carbs the fiber literally everything for all of the items on the menu. So you can try and make a healthy choice before you go. The other thing that you could do to eat healthier is go to places where you know they're going to have some fresh options available. Most places do already have some healthy options on the menu, even places like McDonald's, Pizza Hut, they're all gonna have healthy options on the menu still, they're just less popular typically. So for example, you could always get a wrap, go to a place that has wraps and fresh proteins and vegetables or fresh sandwiches as well. Those are going to be quick and easy fast food choices. And a lot of these places do have fresh and large salads available with a lean protein that you could add to it. Other tips for eating out at restaurants include if you're eating a salad, try and get a vinaigrette instead of the creamy dressings. And really try and skip the high sodium condiments such as pickles, olives, soy sauce, and teriyaki sauce. And you can always ask the waiter or waitress to not add salt to your meal, such as like the fries. So you can always ask what are your options. And if you are choosing proteins, choosing grilled, roasted, baked, broiled, steamed, or poached would be much better than braised or breaded 
battered, creamed, crispy, or deep fried cooking methods. So always uh, look at the description of how the food's being made. Now we're going to move on to label reading. The past few classes we went to the carbohydrate section, so now we're going to discuss the sodium and the fat section. There are two parts of the label that you can look at. One would be the nutrition facts table, and the other one would be the ingredients list. Here we have four crackers. So if we're looking at the four crackers, we can go down to the sodium and see that it's 45 milligrams. 45 milligrams would be a low sodium choice. You can compare it to the 2,000 milligrams we're trying to stay under in a day. But a much easier way to do it for sodium is actually to look at the percentage here. So remember for carbohydrates and fiber, always look at the grams. But for sodium, you can look at the percentage. Here it says 2%. Anything that is 5% sodium per serving or less is going to be a low sodium product. If it's 15% or more, that's going to be high sodium. Anywhere in between that is kind of like a medium amount of sodium. So that would be a quick way to see what amount of sodium it has. And you can use the same rule for fat here. So it has 3 grams of fat for the four crackers, but it's 5% fat. That tells you the percentage of fat intake compared to the daily amount for the average adult's needs of calories. So here we have 5%, which is going to still be a low-fat cracker serving. You do want to keep in mind your serving size. So if you're going to be eating eight crackers, well, then you would just double those percentages, which the sodium would still be low, but now the fat would be more in the medium zone. So just be mindful of that. But all in all, we still want to stick to our carbohydrate goals here. If we double that serving size and we're eating these crackers as a snack, we will be going over our carbohydrate budget for a snack, which should be 15 grams of carb or less. So just still base it on your carbohydrate amount and carbohydrate goals for that time. And then you could also look at the ingredients list here. So if I looked at that first, it says whole grain wheat. That's a good option for it has a high fiber grain. And soybean oil I know is liquid, so it's going to be unsaturated. And then salts at the very end. So the ingredients list is looking very good just by itself as well. And then we just double checked that with the nutrition facts table which also has low fat and low sodium according to the percentages shown here, like I just mentioned. The other part that you could glance at is the saturated fat and the trans fat, which is right under the fat heading. So it's 3%, which is also going to be low. You do want to make sure that the trans fat is 0 grams, so this would be another case to look at the gram amount. We don't want any trans fats in our food. So try and look for products that have always oh, zero grams of trans fats. Let's say you were walking down the cracker aisle and you saw two different boxes that caught your eye. The left one is the one we just went over on the last slide. And on the right, we have a different one. You can look at both the nutrition facts table or the ingredients list first. It doesn't matter where you start. But I typically start on the nutrition facts table myself. So I'm just going to go that route. If I compare the nutrition facts tables right next to each other side by side, I still want to look at the serving size and make sure they are similar. So since crackers are all different sizes, typically depending on the brand, you want to compare the weight of the serving. So in brackets, you'll see on the left side, it says it's 18 grams of crackers in weight. And on the right side, it's 22. So that's a pretty similar serving. You can just go along and compare that directly. And then we go down to fat here. So since we're going to look at the whole list now, I'll look at the fat content. We have 5 grams of fat compared to 3 grams of fat. So the one on the left is going to be lower, which is better. Then we have saturated fat. There are 3 grams on the right and then 0.5 grams on the left. So another point for the left side. I kind of give them... A point system like it's a game and then the one with the most points wins um, next we have you can go straight down to sodium on the right we have 190 milligrams and on the left 45 so another point for the left side and then if we compare the net carbs on the right we have 14 minus 1 gram of fiber 
So 13 grams of net carbs for this option. And then on the left, we have 13 grams of carb minus 2, so 11 carbs. So the one on the left is still going to be lower in carbs. It's also higher in fiber and lower in fat and lower in sodium, so overall looking better. Then if we still wanted to look at the ingredients list, we could compare those. So the one on the right side has wheat flour, which is okay, but not as good as whole grain wheat. Then we have wheat germ, which is good. We have coconut oil, so you want to think back to is this saturated or solid, or is it unsaturated liquid? And coconut oil is considered a solid fat. It is solid at room temperature, making it saturated. Then we have whole wheat flour, which is good, but now it's towards the middle of the list. We want the good stuff at the beginning. We have modified palm oil. It's another saturated fat. We have sugar in our crackers, not ideal. And then canola oil, which would be the healthiest fat included here, is at the end. So by comparing both the ingredients list and the nutrition facts table, we can see that the crackers on the left side would be a better option, both for blood sugar and for heart health when looking at the fats, the sodium, and the carbohydrate, and the fiber intake. If possible, we want to try and limit sugar and alcohol the best we can. Of course, it's okay to consume these foods sometimes, perhaps at special occasions or parties, but they should not be a regular part of your diet on a daily day basis. So let's just see how much sugar, in fact, is in here. For half a cup of unsweetened fruit juice, so this is not sweetened, just regular fruit juice, it has four teaspoons of sugar in half a cup. So this can add up very quickly, and again, it's the fast type of sugar that's going to spike blood sugar. It's not going to be a nice slow release. Next we have a can of pop, which on average has 9 to 12 teaspoons of sugar. Then we have a piece of pie, which this is a fairly standard restaurant serving. It has 12 teaspoons of sugar. And then just a quarter of a cup of candy has 7 teaspoons of sugar already. As a rule of thumb, we want to try not to go over 12 teaspoons of added sugar in one day. So these foods will get you there very quickly. Trying to stick to natural foods like fruit that have sugar in them naturally as your main source of sugars should be the goal. All in all, both sugar and alcohol will increase your triglycerides. Any type of refined or low fiber white carbohydrate will do so as well so remember when we raise the triglycerides when those are high in the bloodstream the blood is more sticky and more likely to clot so we don't want that we want the triglycerides to be within the normal range and have nice thin and smooth blood so by reducing our sugar and alcohol intake this can help control those triglycerides and also help with weight reduction and reduce your risk of heart disease and also complications from diabetes. If we're talking about alcohol here, what do you think are the alcohol recommendations for a man or a woman? So we want to think back to what one drink is. Um, so here we have 12 ounces of beer would count as one drink. One and a half ounces of a distilled liquor would count as one drink, and five ounces of wine. And typically for a woman, we do not want to exceed two of these beverages per day, and for a man, no more than three, if it has been deemed safe for us to drink by our physicians. What does healthy eating look like? This slide is going to summarize everything we've learned in the classes so far, just to make it nice and simple for you as a takeaway because there was a lot of information thrown out there. So here's just a little summary. We want to make sure we're eating at least three meals a day, spaced roughly four to six hours apart, with the option of having a snack in between. Water should be the main beverage of choice to ensure adequate hydration and keep the kidneys happy. Fruits and vegetables should be included daily, specifically getting vegetables in two times a day at two separate meals. Whole grains should be used instead of refined or white grains most of the time. Beans and lentils are a great low-fat, high-fiber protein option that can be used to replace animal proteins at some points. 
Nuts and seeds are also another very heart healthy, blood sugar friendly snack that can also be sprinkled into meals on salads or yogurt on toast throughout the day. Healthy fats are important to include to make sure that you are full at the meal, anywhere from the healthy oils we've discussed to avocados, nuts and seeds like we just mentioned, and you can also use things like lower fat cheese, which be, would be okay in moderation. Fish should be consumed at least twice a week, and if you're choosing animal proteins, look for lean cuts of meat, chicken with the skin off, and eggs are another option. Lower fat dairy and alternatives, so you don't have to drink cow's milk, but if you are having an alternative, make sure it's fortified with calcium. And opt for variety. So you'll see here many different colors, trying to choose different fruits and vegetables every week, different grains, to make sure you're giving your body all of the nutrients it needs because it needs to get a variety of foods to do so. To summarize our heart healthy eating habits, you can see here the table outlines specific nutrition or food recommendations that are going to target specific parts of the cholesterol panel. So in the LDL section, the second column, you'll see that to lower your LDL cholesterol, we want to focus on eating more fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans and lentils, essentially eating more fiber, which is also in nuts and seeds, and switching to healthy fats. And then, which in turn is going to reduce your saturated fat intake. So especially if you're eating more plant proteins, that would be helpful to get both healthy fats and more fiber. And then being active and having a healthy body weight also helps to improve your cholesterol. If you specifically are trying to raise your HDL cholesterol, the biggest thing that you can do here is quit smoking if you smoke and then be active. Regular physical activity is going to be the biggest driver to raising your HDL cholesterol and also having a healthy body weight. Lowering your triglycerides, on the other hand, is going to have more of a focus on getting those healthy fats in, specifically omega-3s, so from fish or the other sources of omega-3s we discussed in this class today. Eating less saturated fat. Eating less sugar and processed carbohydrates is going to have a big impact and improvement as well, as well as limiting your alcohol intake, even if you are within the recommended range or limit for alcohol right now. Let's say you're a man and you're having three alcoholic beverages a day. Trying to reduce it to two or one would still be helpful. And then again, being active is going to help improve your triglycerides. So in the far right column, you'll see to lower your risk of heart disease, a combination of any one of these diet and lifestyle habits listed is going to be a benefit. So I encourage you today to choose maybe one or two things that you can work on. What really stuck out to you that you can work on after today's class that you are interested in trying? So if something does not that was mentioned today was not something that you think that you want to do, like you don't want to try something, don't start there. Start with something else that you feel comfortable doing because, again, any one good change is going to be a positive and reduce your risk of heart disease and improve your blood sugar management. And I do want to highlight on the bottom, even though this is a nutrition class, how helpful being active is. It will literally improve your entire cholesterol panel as well as improve your blood sugar and your insulin sensitivity. So another big bonus for diabetes and blood sugar as well.